Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show. Glad to have you guys here on this 30th. It's almost Halloween. Guess all the kids have got their costumes right now. Or they're planning their costumes. Halloween Eve. So it's the 30th today. Monday, the 30th of October, 2023. Thank you for tuning in. Glad to have you guys here. Uh, now, I've been talking about this for a long time. Extraordinary, ferocious, terrifying. Approaching a time when markets lose faith. In the United States, physical sustainability. Now, that's the first time I've seen this in print. Now, it's on an article that I can't get in to view it. Because I haven't got a membership. <laughs> this is just indicative of our society we have today. So many things are excluded from us. But I, I know the gist of it, and I've been saying this for a long time on my show. I've been talking about it. An implosion in the financial system. And these expurlatives that they're using here, extraordinary, ferocious, terrifying, when the markets lose faith in the United States' physical sustainability. I mean, this is obvious that the, that the sustainability's gone. It's been gone for a long time, but it's when it really becomes manifest to the average people out there. They, they can see that it's going down. They can see for themselves that the Titanic is sinking, and then they want the lifeboats. So you guys know what the lifeboat is, don't you? It's getting into something that's out of the dollar, something that's real, something that's tangible. It could be gold, could be silver. For rich people, maybe it's artwork. Uh, it could be car, a car. If, if, you know, I mean, a car is a real physical thing. It has use and utilitarian value. What value does these paper bills have once... They faith is lost in them. Faith is lost in U.S. physical sustainability. You gotta think about that for a little bit. Uh, now, in this Israel Hamas war that's going on, it says unfathomable, unfathomable. <laughs> I'm having a hard time pronouncing unfathom, unfathom. Horrible horrors. <laughs> no, uh, it, well, this is not a laughing matter, though. Got to really get serious here. This German woman, very beautiful young woman, paraded naked, and now she's found dead. This just goes to show you the horrors that's, that's going on with this war and how what's happening right now. In Israel, it's just absolutely. This is horrible. Look, it's such a pretty young girl. Isn't this a crying shame? Why? Why do they have to. Why, why is, is, as a species, do we have to do things? Why do we have to have so much hate all the time? Why is there so many haters in society? Uh, take a look at this. Now, I'm not going to read exactly what it says here to you, but this is a Pakistan senator. And he's sparking controversy. But you got to understand, Pakistan is a very powerful nuclear nation. But it goes. this goes back to... If, as a species, if we can't get rid of this hate... Now that this is a nuclear age, World War II, this hatred was there. But we didn't have nuclear weapons. 
Well, I mean, some people might strain it on that and say, okay, we did because we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. But we didn't really have nuclear weapons as such. The war ended. As, as the war ended, we were just getting nuclear weapons. The world was. But now, we're not just getting nuclear weapons. We're building armaments. I shouldn't say we are. Our leaders are building armaments as fast as they can. They've already got a massive stockpiles of nuclear weapons. And this kind of hate, we could end our species. Poof, gone. And it's this kind of hate. Uh, look at this guy. He, he's got bad eyes. To me, anyway. That's my... My, I, that's what I think. He's, he, he's, seems to me to be very hard, and it's a very hard, harsh statement he's made here. Now, moving on. This is from the Bible. You know, and it says, as, in, as the days of Noah were, so also shall be the, the coming of the Son of Man. What does it mean by that? You know, there's other scriptures that says that this this approaching crisis in the Bible would come as a thief in the night. In other words, surprise many and catch them off guard. And this this scriptural reference in here uh, alludes to the same thing. It says, uh, "As for the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage, until the day Noah entered into the ark." In other words, just before the disaster occurred, they were taking no note. And most of the people in the world today think everything's going along fine. They, they, they don't realize what a situation we're in right now. And I'm going to try to explain it to you guys in the, in the next brief statement that I'm going to make. How dangerous it is right now. Uh, do you do understand that the NATO nations, if you attack one NATO nation, you attack them all. It's a pact, what they call a pact. And I've been telling you guys in my shows quite recently that sides are being taken in this war that's occurring right now. Sides are being taken. Now, you also understand that other countries not just NATO nations, watch out for each other and they form these pacts. And sometimes they form these pacts secretly. But like China has a pact with, with North Korea. If somebody attacked China, North Korea is little brother, they call them. That's what China calls North Korea, little brother. And they would, they would help in the fight. They would jump right in, North Korea would, and protect China. And China would do the same for North Korea. You know right now that if Russia were to attack Poland, Poland is part of the pact of NATO. And, and NATO would invoke Article 5 and, and it would be on. It would be war, big time. Well, other countries, they form these pacts as well. And so Putin has been warning. Putin has said he's warned Israel and Hamas that the conflict could spread beyond the Middle East. He's condemned the Gaza bombings, Putin has. Now, what does he mean by that? What's he alluding to here? That it could spread beyond the Middle East. Well, let's take a look right here. It says Iran just joined a pact with Moscow and Beijing. Moscow and China, they've joined a pact. Here's what it means for the United States. And, and, and here, see in this picture, here's, here is Iran seated here in this picture with Putin. During the joining of this pact. So when did it happen? It, this pact happened around July. Uh, it's, I guess July 4th, as the U.S. was celebrating its 247th birthday, uh, Iran was celebrating the birth of a new multipolar world order. 
the pact. Now, what I heard is Hezbollah just... Now, that's that's not Hamas. It's Hezbollah. I know sometimes people can get them confused because they both start with an H. But Hezbollah is just to the north. And Hamas is in Gaza. And they're up around Lebanon. Hezbollah. Hezbollah might join the war very, very soon. I mean... Very soon. It's getting closer and closer to the war spreading to Iran. And how long is Iran going to sit? Because I'm going to tell you guys something. People typically, and I, I mean, I'm changing the subject a little bit, but it is actually connected to this. People keep a, a, a generally a couple weeks of food in their kitchen. Well, they might have a a bag of flour, and they might have a few other things, you know, some salt, and a number of things that they keep in their kitchen in order to cook. But if you use that stuff for food, most this is typical people around the world, and the people in Gaza are probably not much, no exception. They probably carry a couple weeks of food in their kitchens in Gaza, you know, in 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 the Gaza region. Uh, now it's been about over 20 days now since they haven't they've had their food cut off so these kitchen supplies in the city uh, are probably starting to really run out now and now they're getting to the point where they really don't have anything to eat how long is this going to go on before these countries like Iran, their own citizens start to say, hey, you know what? Uh, they get m upset and, and uh, they start to, uh, uh, about what's happening to their fellow peoples before they start to put pressure on their own governments to do something. This war has more impetus to spread in the Middle East than any situation. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, for years there, when I was a young adult, there was always trouble. There's always been trouble in the Middle East. And this is why people tend to ignore it, because over here in the West, it seems like there's all... All the time I've been alive, there's always been a situation happening in the Middle East. I mean, it's just... But this is different, guys. This is totally different this time. This is much more complex. There's much more hate behind it. And this could spiral out of control. There's two points of danger. It is when a major war is beginning and when it's concluding. And these are the most dangerous periods for it to go nuclear. So, it might only be a matter of days left, just a few days left, before this thing erupts into gosh only knows what. And it's frightful, because Iran could very well get involved in this. Now, does Iran have nuclear weapons? Well, from what I've read, I guess they've got enough fissionable material to make at least probably six. And they've got hypersonic delivery systems. In fact, as far as hypersonic missiles go, Iran's one of your more up-to-date countries on the hypersonic missiles that can carry a nuclear payload. And, and one of the missiles that Iran has is so fast, it's almost unstoppable, and it can, it can, it can duck and dart, dart and weave, you know, it can evade. It can evade uh, being shot down, and it's uh, super fast, and it's able to carry a massive payload long distances 
So you have to consider that too. That Iran very possibly by now could have a nuclear weapon or nuclear weapons and they could actually have a delivery system. So what would that spark if that were to happen? Uh, what times we live in right now? What can I say? Uh, now, we're going to get in and take a look at the markets. Do you remember what I told you guys earlier about this, how they're describing it? Extraordinary, ferocious, terrifying. Uh, approach, approaching a time when the markets lose faith. Well, we also got bond problems here. They're spiraling out of control. And, you know, this is a safe haven asset, and, and uh, it has been creeping up. I, I, I tend to think that, you know, when silver finally becomes unhinged and goes to the upside massively, it's going to catch all of us unawares. And the reason why is because it's cried wolf so many times. Sometimes when you watch something and the pot never boils, the pot never boils, the pot never boils. And then so you say, well, I could take one minute and just step into the bathroom, you know, just for a minute and come back in. And just when you do that, you're watching the pot for a whole hour. You step into the bathroom and she boils over. That could be the way it was silver. It took a little jump this morning. But silver's going to be an early detector of this when this finally comes. And you say, well, what in the heck am I talking about finally comes? There's going to be a sudden inflection point. A massive shift or reversal in everything. Talking about it for ages. I call it a deflationary spike event. That's my own name for it. I, I Sometimes I give things my own name, you know. But I've been talking about it for years now, this, this event. And we have actually been a, had a deflating monetary supply now for quite a while. And rising bond prices. Now, now just for a minute here, while we're in on the subject, uh, uh, I'm just going to talk about... You know, the banks are getting ready to go down. And, you know, I've been talking about how uh, how something, a black swan's going to come along and make the Fed change direction. Well, the blank, banks right now are bleeding. Oh, my gosh, they got so many mortgages on their books and stuff. And the people aren't selling their homes. Why aren't the people selling their homes? Why aren't the home prices falling? Well, it's because there's not an awful lot on... You know, you, you follow supply and demand. Okay, if there's not a lot of supply, even if there's only a small demand, if there's not a lot of supply to meet that small demand, prices will still stay up. And this is the way with homes. And why is there not a lot, large supply of homes on the markets to drive the price down? Because people are hanging on to their homes. We had this long period, this quite a long period of 0% interest rates, Mortgages, people were buying up fixed rate mortgages on their homes. They're in there now. They're sitting on their fixed rate mortgage. They've purchased their home all across America. And they ain't selling because they know what a good deal they got. Where can they get that deal again now? Mortgages are like, what are they, like 8%, up close to 8%. And, and so this is a, they know if they sell their home and they have to refinance now. And they say, no, I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to sell my home and try to get into another, try to move someplace else or anything like that. That's, that's come and gone during the COVID. Everybody was doing it. Interest rates were low. But now they're, they're sitting. And so that's not flooding the market with homes. And there's not an awful lot of buyers out there, but the amount of homes is meeting the amount of buyers, so the price isn't dropping very much. The mortgage, now, these mortgage rates are continuing to climb. So what's happening with all of this? Well, the banks. The banks are sitting on these. And they're taking a beating. They're taking a, a, a not just their bonds. Their bonds is what kind of made Silicon Valley Bank and these other banks. Now it's going to be mortgages, too. And, and these big banks are bleeding. 
And you know, here's the here's the kicker, guys. March, which is only like what five months away. These banks are going to owe four hundred billion dollars back to the Fed, and and this this banking thing, this this uh, oh what was the name of it? This funding program that they had from the Fed to fund these banks that were going under. It expires. All by design. The Federal Reserve, in the end, is... i tell you what it's like, guys. Honest <laughs> to God, I'll tell you what it's like. What it reminds me of. Uh, it reminds me of the Monopoly game, you know. Uh, <laughs> you'd be very careful who you make the banker in the Monopoly game. <laughs> and we've made the Fed the banker in this Monopoly game. And you guys got, if you've played Monopoly and you know about Monopoly, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Be careful who you make the banker. And this is our problem right now, is we've made the Fed the banker and they are really, really taking us to the cleaners. They're the biggest cheat in the world. In the Monopoly game. <laughs> and this is a, this the world is, is basically a Monopoly game for them and they're gonna take all the cards. They're gonna leave you with nothing. Well, they've already told you. They said <laughs> you'll have nothing. And then somehow they added you'll be happy. How are you gonna be happy sitting on the curb with rain falling on you and, and cold and shivering and no food to eat? <laughs> Tell me how you're gonna be happy. Honest to God, I mean, this world's getting sicker and sicker by the day. Okay, now, we're going to take a look at cryptos right now. 34,628 for Bitcoin. Ethereum's at 1819. And XRP is 58 point. Wow, look at that. XRP's jumped from 54 to 58 cents. That was quick. Uh, okay, so now let's move on to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is, which is up 282 points today at 32,700. So, you know, if nothing else, when March hits, the banks are going to have another $400 billion added to their hole that they've dug themselves in. I don't think it's going to last until March. Tell you honestly. We're headed to a cataclysm. Cataclysmic events are unfolding. And they're unfolding really fast. I hope you guys are making your preps. Or getting your preps finalized. or, or And if you finalized your preps and said, Oh, you rub your hands together say, I'm all done. Do more. Because you'll be thankful you did. Because this, this is just a total wipeout mess. This this whole this whole system we have structured here for the last six or seven thousand years. We've done things in the past twenty years. I say we, I'm not talking about I'm included in it, because I didn't do it. It's like the old Billy Joel song, I didn't start the fire. <laughs> you know, remember that song? Anyway. It's going down, it's sinking, and I've done shows. I've warned you guys, like a, two years ago, I had shows the Titanic sinking. But you know the Titanic took a long time to sink. But there were certain people on board knew it was sinking. They knew it was going to go down. But other people didn't know. They never thought it was possible. And a big ship like that takes a long time to sink. And this is the biggest ship of all. But in the final stages, when it finally sinks under the, the waters, it goes down really fast. It sucks everybody down with it. And I'm afraid that's what this is. And it's, it's the entire system. And we did things about 20 years ago. We did things that we should never have embarked upon. It mostly has to do with computers. It was as big a mistake as when we built the nuclear bombs. And that was another big mistake that we did. Should have never messed with that. 
Oppenheimer and all that, the uh, Manhattan Project and all that. We should just put that aside and not bother with any of that stuff. We opened up a Pandora's box. And now, with the computer age, we've opened up a bigger Pandora's box. And putting our faith in all of these computer technologies... Oh, sure, they're wonderful. I mean, it's so fast. Just look at how it makes it how easy it is to get directions if you use your phone to go someplace or something. How convenient all of it is. But what the problem is is we've trusted it too much. We've left off our old ways too fast. And we've put all of our faith in this system to provide for us, and we don't have any redundant system in place. And this is going to fail us. Its weakest link is the Internet itself, which in the case of war is so vulnerable. Well, you, you guys realize, must realize how vulnerable your internet is. I, I imagine every one of you has waked up some morning and your internet isn't working. And you're like, why isn't it working? I need to get the news today. I need to know what's going on. I need, I need to text my friend, blah, blah, blah. Got no internet. Why? Because it's been haphazardly put in, strung everywhere, these, these telecommunications cables. And that's all they are is cables that carry this stuff. Without the carrier, the Internet don't work. People think the Internet's magic. They think, oh, I'll always have Internet. Internet works everywhere. No. One cable's cut, and it don't deliver. And if it's a big cable, and confuse, say, say a number of, just to stay for, just for argument's sake, say, say Russia were to, cut a whole bunch of big cables or some other country may you know or to cut a whole bunch of big cables we hear about cables being cut all the time uh the chaos that would ensue if the entire say say the entire world's internet went down and say all that was left was starlink which most people don't have military would be probably all right they'd just hook into starlink but Say it was all all cut. Well, even if the military was okay, and even if certain other people that have that would be okay as far as being able to connect to the Internet, if everybody else was cut, the chaos that would ensue wouldn't allow them to make repairs because the system has to be run in order to repair the system. It's like a catch-22. In order for this system to repair itself, it has to function. And if it can't function, it can't repair itself. It's kind of like the guy that goes in to get a job. He says, can I have a job here at this restaurant? And the guy says, well, you got any experience, any experience waiting tables or anything like that? The guy says, no. He says, well, come back when you get experience. And the guy says, well, I need to get the job to get the experience. And this is the situation we've got ourselves into. We can repair this system if the system's running. But if the system shuts down it needs repairs to make it run, we can't repair it because of the chaos that would ensue. Every See, we this system operates under a structure of orderliness. And now that syst that structure of order orderliness comes from the internet. Everything comes from the internet. But the internet itself is what breaks. How do you repair it once the orderliness is lost? I don't, uh, it's, it's a hard concept to get your head around. But believe me, if you live through it, then you'll see the flaw. Then you'll know about the flaw. That's if you live through it. Because if you can imagine, the Internet's connected to all the... Uh, uh, the telecommunications is the only reason you receive power, and you need power in order to have the telecommunications. Again, another catch-22. It's all tied in together. It's all structured together, one big mess. And when that mess goes down, it ain't coming back. Except in places. After it's restructured, it would be restructured. We structured it to begin with. We can restructure it again, mankind can. But how long would that take? By that time, 
where would we all be? Because we would end up going through probably a long period of exactly what the people in Gaza are going through right now. Are you prepared to live through something like that? And this is the situation we've got ourselves in worldwide. Along with everything else, like the. the this is the first thing they're going to do in war is try to cut our communications, too. Isn't that the first thing Israel did when they attacked Gaza is cut their communications off? The, the, well, when we get into a World War III with all these other countries, that's the first thing they're going to be interested in. And probably the same here. It's all holes barred once the wor real world war starts. It's all holes barred. No holes barred, I should say. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so where were we here before I got, oh, we're, we're, we, were, uh, we were looking at the Dow Jones and we were uh, checking crude oil here at 83.63. It's down $1.91. Oh my gosh, I'm going to tell you, this is cheap compared to where this stuff could go and go suddenly if this war were to break out bigger. And it could at any time. Bonds and rates today, we're looking at rising yields. This is another disaster in the making right here. Because each time these things tick up a little bit higher, the banks are bleeding worse. And I'm not talking to small banks, I'm talking to big ones now. They're bleeding out. Is your money safe in the bank? No. I'm going to tell you guys something you might not know, and you need to know this. Used to be in the old days, back when I was a young guy, you deposit money in the bank. You were a depositor to that bank, and that was your money in the bank. They've changed the laws, the definition of the law. Now you are considered what's called an unsecured lender to the bank. When you give them money, it's not your money anymore. Now it's the bank's money. To do with as they please. A lot of people don't know that. And also they've written in provisions into the bank for something that's called a bail-in. This goes back to Cyprus. Where they, where they was the first test case of a bail-in. And what a bail-in is, is they give you something called a haircut on your bank deposit on the amount of money that you have in the bank. They can take as much or as little as they want. They can take it all if they want to support the bank. And that doesn't come under your FDIC. Of course, they've never done that really yet, except in Cyprus is the only place that they've done it. But that was a test case. But they got the law in place. They got it ready to go. So, needless to say, you know, the old in the old days, when I was a young guy, they used to say, money in the bank, it's just like money in the bank. Well, now money in the bank ain't money in the bank any longer. Sorry. Okay, moving on here. We got these yields at 4.8% on the U.S. 10-year, 4.88. Uh, the U.S. 30-year is at 5.04, and they're both up. 3.6 basis points up on the 10-year, 2.3 on the 30 year and the US dollar index today is at 106.22 and falling but it's not going much of anywhere it's fell a little bit thank you guys for listening to my show like and subscribe and we'll catch you guys in the next episode and have a great afternoon bye bye